Welcome back to Tawanya Tells. I am Tawanya and I am here to share with you stories about Boston's black community. Before I begin, I'm going to go through the land acknowledgement. Let us take a moment to acknowledge the indigenous people who cultivated, nourished, and inhabited this land we call the United States of America, land that was forcibly taken from them. The state of Massachusetts, an Algonquin word meaning great hills, was inhabited by indigenous tribes, Mohegan, Wapanog, and Mohegan. It is because of them we exist on these lands. Right, so let's get into it. Happy Black History Month. Absolutely was not going to let this get away without me rolling out a new video. So here we are. And I want to make it clear that I, as many people, recognize that Black history is certainly something that should be celebrated 365 days. It is not just the month of February. However, it will be highlighted in February. And so that's what I am here to do. Highlight some of the history and things that have happened within Boston's Black community over the years. The images that you're currently looking at here are of the, the Museum of African American History, which is located in the Beacon Hill area of Boston. That's in downtown, not around the Boston Commons. And then we also have here the Black Heritage Trail. So these are places that I certainly have frequented over the years, um, have walked the Black Heritage Trail, something you could do on your own. So if you are coming into Boston to visit, I encourage you to do that. I also encourage you to check out the museum. Um, if you're a local and you just have taken this for granted, as I believe many locals typically do, you just say, one day I'm going to get around to it, but you don't quite do it yet. Definitely go and check them both out. An amazing experience and just an important thing I believe that you should do. All right, so I want to talk a little about the 54th Regiment, whom folks may be familiar with, especially if you watched the movie Glory. That was out back in 1989. Um, so if you haven't watched it, you take a look. It tells the story of these men who volunteered to enlist and be the first black infantry to go off to fight in the Civil War against slavery. And these black men were led by Robert Gould Shaw, who is an abolitionist, born into a family of abolitionists. And he took on the challenge, or not even the challenge, but he was more than willing to lead this group of men to fight against a horrific part of American history, which is slavery. And the memorial that we see here um, is made of bronze. It was unveiled on Memorial Day back in 1897. It was created by Augustus St. Gaudens, G-A-U-D-E-N-S. And it was presented and currently is located um, at the same spot where the infantry um, began their march off to war. And, I don't know, stuff like this always kind of gets me choked up. It, it just blows my mind to think that they knew the sacrifice, the great sacrifice they were about to make. What's interesting about this is, as I also have here next to the memorial, if you're watching this on YouTube, you'll see it, is a flyer to recruit. And they're having to recruit for volunteers. Most of these men were volunteers because Massachusetts didn't have a lot of black people, right? The population was a huge. This is a free state at that time. So therefore, you know, most there were very few blacks, right? Most blacks, unfortunately, during this time are, are held in slavery captive. And so... They're recruiting. So people came from New York, Ohio, Indiana, black men coming from as far as Canada and even parts of the Caribbean 
to fight against slavery. I mean, folks are coming from everywhere. And people were as young as 16, 16 years of age. Some young men made the decision to fight against slavery. And some did so alongside their fathers. That is such a moving and sad consequence that families made. But what is interesting about the flyer as well is that, you know, how they're recruiting. So the language, you know, looking for men of Afri African descent, you know. But these men knew if they were captured, even though they were already free, they could be put back into slavery. I shouldn't say put back into because they weren't slaves before. They would become slaves if they were captured. But the money that some were going to be paid, the food, the clothing, the state aid to their families, a piece that folks don't talk about often is for many blacks, the military was and is still a means for how they uplift their family. Like this is the sacrifice people made to not only create a better life for themselves or their family, but in this case, for our nation, at least from my perspective. And the reason why this has a little soft spot in my heart, the regiment and, you know, looking at the way in which they were attempting to recruit uh, the soldiers is they actually train at Camp Meg, M-E-I-G, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. And that is, was located at the time in Reedville, Mass. Reedville is a neighborhood in Hyde Park where I grew up. So that really um, just resonated with me, just made me, you know, just reminded me how we're walking on the grounds that so many before us sacrificed their lives just gave so much and here we walk and drive these streets and often we're not even thinking of who was here before us just think about that this was happening they trained I live in Mattapan now they trained only down the street from me in Hyde Park where I grew up so this memorial is located at the top of the Boston Commons, which is in the Beacon Hill area of downtown Boston, right across from our state house. If you are standing there across the street, can't miss it. It's right in your face. Perhaps if you're hustling by as many city folks tend to be doing, you see it, but you don't really see it. But if you're ever in town or if you live here, and this is one of those things you're always like, yeah, I'm going to go check it out one day and you haven't done it because that's just naturally what most folks do. They think they have forever to go and experience their city and see it in a way in which they usually don't. Go and take a look at this. This is, this is an amazing piece that is commemorating such an important time in our history as a nation and in our history as a city. And I, as a black woman, my history just as a black person in America. Uh, two additional facts I want to share about the regiment. <clears throat> Their most famous enlisted men were two of Frederick Douglass' sons, Charles and Louis Douglass. And I just, I didn't know that. I didn't. So I really thought that was a nice um, fun fact to learn about the regiment so yeah please by all means come to the city come check it out um so now i'd like to introduce an amazing person that made a significant contribution that continues to this day to the black community in boston uh, muriel snowden 
And Muriel Snowden, born July 14, 1916, passed September 30th, 1988. Muriel was a community organizer who made Boston her home. She is from New Jersey, she and her husband, and then they moved to Boston. Um, she attended Radcliffe College and studied at New York School of Social Work. But when Muriel came here to Boston, where they, you know, the city they made their home, planted their roots, she committed wholeheartedly to the black community, residing in the neighborhood of Roxbury, which has an amazing black history. But I'm appreciative for Muriel Snowden and her husband pushing forward to fight against these injustices. So the Freedom House is located in Dorchester. For those of you who are familiar, I've actually, I think I may have been there only one time. It was just recently renovated. So if you uh, get a chance, you should drive by. It's um, 5 Crawford Street. I read on their website, looks like they aspire to expand. Um, there's another building, it's the 14 Crawford Street. Um, so hopefully that will be a goal of theirs that they definitely are able to achieve. Freedom House offers amazing programs uh, for young people, specifically around education, whether it's college and high school. And, you know, this is something that's near and dear to uh, Muriel Snowden's heart. And you know what, let me, let me back up. So partly why I even want to introduce Muriel Snowden is because once again, someone who lives here, sometimes you hear names, but you don't know the story. Or sometimes you only hear part of the name. And for years, I would always hear Snowden. Didn't hear a first name, just the last name, especially when it came to the high school. And then I was like, you know what? I need to know who this Snowden person is. And then you start realizing like all this amazing stuff. And this amazing work that Muriel and her husband put forth in the black community here to protecting the black community, fighting for. And it's crazy because oftentimes you don't even realize that's who these people are. You say a name, this is the name of the building, and you just go on about your life and you don't always think about well, who is this person? Why was this building or this space or this land named after them? So I was excited to get to learn more about Muriel Snowden's story. I mentioned a school. So when I was a young girl, there was Copley High. Well, that was right when I was getting ready to head into high school. And then shortly after, people started referring to it as Snowden High. And I later learned it's Muriel Snowden High. And Muriel definitely was an advocate for education. Um, and so even after her retirement, she remained a civic leader within the community. Uh, Muriel Snowden also was a lecturer. She, lecturer. she taught at Simmons College School of Social Work, served on several boards, including Harvard University, Tufts University, Babson College, New, the New England Aquarium, the Boston Museum of Science, and the Radcliffe Black Women's Oral History Project. Don't forget, she's an alum of Radcliffe. So yeah, so Copley High, his name was eventually changed in honor of Muriel's legacy. At Snowden International High School, it's a Boston Public High School, they have a rigorous curriculum, one that is founded in international relations and foreign languages, which is area that or are areas that Muriel Snowden really emphasized and felt strongly about. 
So students there learn languages such as Chinese, Japanese, Spanish, and French. They also are expected to have a passport because there was an immersion program where students have an opportunity to go to countries where these languages are being spoken. So from the website, I saw that some of the countries they partner with are China, Japan, Canada, England, and Costa Rica. So the high school is located in the Back Bay area of Boston. And it is on 150 at 150 Newberry Street. So it's a building that they do have a sign, but I think it is very easy. Well, if you're a local to probably just breeze on by and not even think or realize like, oh, there's actually a high school right here. Um, but it's definitely one that I've always heard really good things about, has a good reputation as far as their academics go. So if you're from the area and you have young people that are coming up, put that one on your list as one of the BPS schools that you may want to choose. And know and make sure to share with your young person the story of the amazing woman that the school was renamed after. All right, so now moving right along, we have William Willie O'Ree. And this is one I know just recently my mom shared with me for Black History Month. Like there have been little quick segments on the news here in Boston. Yeah. And Willie O'Ree was featured for one of those segments. And Willie O'Ree, born October 15th, 1935 in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. He was the first black hockey player in the National Hockey League. His debut with the Boston Bruins against the Montreal Canadiens was at the Montreal Forum on January 18th, 1958. I can remember when I first learned that the Boston Bruins was the first NHL team to racially integrate. I was shocked and excited. Right? Because then I'm like, okay, all right, Boston, you was trying to do something. So Willie O'Ree comes, he plays. This is where his season began and ended as far as in the NHL. He played many years prior to this, so he was already an accomplished and well-seasoned hockey player um, playing different teams in Canada. But what I also learned is that when he entered the league there wasn't much fervor and fanfare right like this is the first as they the language they were using at that time negro hockey player and there was no big to do it's like wow what a missed opportunity <laughs> come on now how do, how do we how did they not make a big deal was it the fear of backlash from racists that prevented more of a spotlight being shined on the fact that this was happening and this was happening in Boston? It was mentioned um, when I was doing my research on this that like there was no write up the day he was going to play. There was no write up in like the Boston Globe, which was considered our premier newspaper at the time. We used to also have a um, the Herald, which is no longer, but the Boston Globe or the New York Times, like there was no mention about William Willie O'Ree playing in the NHL. But hey, unfortunately, I'm not surprised you think about the error. But what I also realize is the resilience this man had to enter into this arena knowing the racial climate and that did not deter him. 
right? It, it, he could have easily probably felt like it's not worth it. But number one, it was his personal goal to play professionally in the NHL, to play in the NHL. I shouldn't say professionally. I don't want to discredit his time prior to, to play in the NHL. Not only that, prior to, he sustained a significant eye injury when a hockey puck hit him in the face. He lost 95% of his vision in his right eye, nose broken, cheek broken. He was encouraged to retire, but he said nothing to no one and obviously he did not retire and he gets recruited drafted to come play for the Boston Bruins. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's some resiliency right there. Push through a significant injury to go live out your dream and do so in a period of time where racial unrest I can't even say it was at its highest because we know what the world has been like. The U.S. Senate passed the Willie O'Ree Congressional Gold Medal Act on July 27th, 2021. And in case you're not familiar, the Congressional Gold Medal is awarded to individuals for their distinguished achievements and contributions. I think we all know what achievements and contributions Mr. O'Ree made to the sport of hockey and want to our to the city of Boston and of course just to our nation as a whole right whenever you can make some strides around racial injustices whether you're trying to or not it's a win and it's a win for us all. So he is now in the same stage for um, receiving this Congressional Gold Medal Act as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his wife, Coretta Scott King, um, Jackie Robinson. And then 64 years to the day in which he debuted as a Boston Bruin, the Bruins retired his jersey. That was awesome. Perhaps late to the party for the Boston Bruins, but I hope William Willie O'Ree feels they got it right in the end. All right, folks. So those were the key people I wanted to highlight. And then I'm going to wrap up with a little bit of just fun facts, but they are part of black history and especially black history here in Boston. So this would be for our hip hop heads out there. Do you recognize this face? Are you familiar with the name Guru? Which was an acronym for Gifted Unlimited Rhymes Universal. So the Guru is an American rapper and record producer. His uh, government name, Keith Edward Elam, born July 17, 1961. He passed April 19, 2010, um, after his battle with cancer. The guru is from Boston. If you didn't know, now you know. He was one half of the rap group Gangstar. He grew up, he was born and grew up in Roxbury. Notice this theme, Roxbury always popping up here. And there's a reason for that, and we should explore it. So his parents, his mother was a co-director of the libraries of Boston Public Schools and his father was a judge. He, after high school, he went on to Morehouse College in Atlanta and then found his way to New York, uh, taking some graduate classes at Fashion Institute of Technology in Manhattan. Now, as far as the schools he went to here in Massachusetts, they have several listed. Uh, we have the Advent School located in Beacon Hill, another area, right, that seems like it keeps coming up, a reoccurring theme. 
because there was a time where the Beacon Hill, that was a huge black community that was there, right? Then we also have that he went on to Noble and Greeno School in Dedham. I almost went to that. I almost applied to that school. And Cohasset High School in Cohasset, Mass. So I wanted to share this because we all know that New Edition is probably one of the more well-known musicians, black musicians, to come out of Boston, Mass. But we have a lot of good talent here and a lot of talent that is out there sharing their gift with the world, but we don't always know that they are from Boston. And so I just decided I'll share this little gem. Last but not least, we have Uzo Aduba, born February 10th, 1981. Happy belated birthday. You may recognize her from Netflix original series, Orange is the New Black. She also has many, many other amazing pieces of work prior to and after one of my favorites, Miss Virginia, you can also find on Netflix. Check it out based on true story. It's amazing. But Uzo, also from the Boston area, was born to Nigerian parents. Grew up in Medfield, Massachusetts. She attended Boston University where she studied classical music and competed in track and field. So I just wanted to end with something a little more lighthearted and just remind the folks that we do have amazing talent that comes out of or the Massachusetts area. So thank you for listening. If you are watching this on YouTube, please like, share, and subscribe. Hit the bell so you receive a notification I typically try to roll something out once a month. I'm a woman wearing many hats, grinding on my own. Well, of course, with the help of my niece, but this is definitely um, time consuming. So please be patient. I appreciate the grace. I appreciate when folks do listen. And if you have some suggestions or you wanna come and let's have a conversation about Boston's black community, Maybe you're doing something amazing and you would like to get it out there to folks. I'm more than willing to do that. Yeah, we up in so, your feelings. We be hit a sister up. We be feeling some type of way. Cause we got a smile on our face. We be doing a thing. Switching lanes. We ain't playing no games. I know it's your dream. Take it down on the winning team. We pay the cost to be the boss. If you can't carry your weight, it's your loss. See